Hello, and welcome to another episode of Unstuff America. I am delighted to have today's guest with us today. It's Robert Lee, who's the co-founder and CEO of Rescuing Leftover Cuisine. RLC is a nonprofit here in New York that brings excess food to homeless shelters. Robert, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's great. Great to have you here. So, so f folks may or may not know about RLC. Tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do for work. I mean, you're the CEO, but tell us what that looks like and what your home life is like. Do you live alone? Do you live with other people? Just give us sure. some background. Yeah, that sounds awesome. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm a native New Yorker. I've been born and raised here in, in New York and Queens. Um, lived here all my life. Uh, went to a high school downtown in Manhattan, went to NYU, uh, and then lived here, you know, afterwards and worked at Duke Morgan in asset management for about one year before uh, quitting my job to do um, rescuing that cuisine full time. Um, currently, you know, still a Queens guy. I uh, lived in uh, Flushing and then Sunnyside and now we're in Long Island City in the studio. Um, really like the place and it's a great neighborhood. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a really great. Uh, great so place. sharing a studio with your girlfriend? That's correct. Yes. Yeah. So that's, um, I mean, that's, you can't have too much stuff or it's going to be <laughs> yeah. kind of crowded. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. All right. Um, uh, so what really inspires you? What, are you? what are you passionate about? You know, what gets you psyched every day? Yeah, I mean, uh, number one thing that really motivates me is kind of, you know, obviously rescuing that cuisine. It, it, it is something that um, I, I think is really near and dear to me because the values of kind of, you know, making sure that food is not going to waste and that people who are food insecure are getting fed is something that's really kind of um, ingrained in me ever since I was a little kid. My parents actually came here um, when, uh, actually I wasn't even born, but my brother was really young uh, and they actually didn't know any English when they came here. Uh, and so they struggled a bit. Um, they had uh, a little bit of problems kind of providing food for my brother and I. And so we grew up with the values of, you know, making sure that food is never wasted and that, um, you know, uh, food is kind of a central thing in, in, in our lives. Uh, and so when I came across the concept of food rescue uh, as a, a club, actually, in NYU, uh, I just got super involved and I just thought that it was such an elegant, uh, really efficient model to reduce food waste and feed hungry people. Um, and I think, you know, something like that, I actually didn't even know it was a passion of mine until I, I found that club. Uh -huh. uh, and then I uh, just kept on, you know, expanding it and got really involved in it and then eventually started rescuing with cuisine. And, and while I was working at JP Morgan, I just thought that, you know, what better way to spend my time than to kind of give back to community and really grow this organization. And there are other, um, there are other organizations that um, uh, redistribute food. Tell us a little bit about what distinguishes RLC from City Harvest or some of the other organizations that exist so that yeah. we, we get, I mean, everybody's doing good work and what is it about RLC that is, um, that's unique and that is, uh, so effective in, in getting food to folks who are yeah. food insecure? It's a great question and one that we get a lot and for good reason. Um, we definitely don't want to be duplicating efforts. When we got started in 2013, uh, we did a ton of research um, and we basically realized that there was a little bit of a gap in the food rescue market because um, existing organizations had a minimum pound requirement um, where they would not go buy for food that was below a certain number of pounds of food. Um, and so typically it was around the 50 to about 100 pound range. Um, and we essentially decided to fill in the gap and fill in that niche market where we can pick up food from restaurants that wanted to donate their food but didn't have an outlet to. Um, and essentially, instead of using a fleet of trucks or, you know, own this kind of transportation, we decided to use technology to crowdsource the transportation to the public. Allow for anyone to go to our website, rescueandlifehousing.org, and just sign up for a volunteer event. Jump in and sign up, transport some food for 30 minutes, go home. Super easy. Um, and obviously that allows us to be much more efficient um, and less, you know, less cost for each delivery. Sure. Uh, so we basically operate at about 10 cents per pound. So for every dollar you donate, you can rescue 10 pounds, which can feed eight meals. And industry average is about 24 cents per pound. So we're typically about you know two times, a little bit more than two times as efficient uh, as other organizations in this field. Oh, that's awesome. Um, 
well, back to you. So we know what you're passionate about, which is uh, awesome. Uh, what, what upsets you? What pisses you off? What gets you, what gets you really riled up or when you, when you think about um, the world so at large? Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure there are so many things. Pick uh, one. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think overall inefficiency and, you know, that kind of thing really pisses me off. I think like, you know, things like waste of time um, and, and, and resources, waste of resources like time is, is really what kind of gets me. Uh, going and I think that's one of the things I just could not stand by and watch uh, with rescuing left cuisine because there was so much food going to waste. I mean, forty percent of the food that we consume in this country is going to waste. That's yeah, almost and, half. I mean, it's yeah, crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. And people don't realize that you know if you just took one third of that food, that's enough nutrition to eliminate hunger in the U.S. We actually produce enough food in this country to feed everyone. It's just a distribution problem. Um, and you know, there's a lot of obviously other issues baked into the whole homelessness, homelessness situation, but, um, you know, it's just, it's insane to think that no one has to be hungry. Um, and that waste of resources and that, um, kind of potential that is lost really gets me going. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. No, On a scale from one to 10, one being the least organized and 10 being the most organized, where would you put yourself? I would probably put myself around an eight or nine. Eight or uh, pretty- nine. I'm pretty uh, anal about kind of how I spend my time. Uh-huh. Uh, because, again, I just hate just, like wasting time. It's one of the reasons why I left at Morgan, actually. I just thought that I could be spending more time at Rescue My Cuisine, making more of an impact in people's lives. Um, and one of the things I, I, I kind of do obsessively is um, manage my calendar. And so I have 30 minutes uh, blocks from, you know, basically nine to nine mapping out my entire day <laughs> yeah. and mapping out the time that I spend and, um, you know, doing these like monthly analyses on how I spend my time that month. <laughs> so I'm a little, I probably go a little bit overboard, but, um, it's, it's just a way for me to kind of, you know, get better at, at what I you know, spend my time with and what I do. And so that's kind of how I organize my life. Yeah, no, but I think that's a great takeaway for the listeners. Even if, uh, even if they don't want to be that, um, that exacting and measuring their time. Certainly, I mean, I talk about toggle all the time as a tremendously powerful tool to figure out where you're spending your time and the idea that your calendar is driving your day. It's not a series of post-its or the back of an envelope where you're scribbling notes to yourself and hoping that that's going to get the things done that yeah. matter to you in the day. It's just, yeah. it's a, it's a fool's errand. If you think that that's going to move you through time right. and space effectively, right. you need to, you need to quantify things and chunk them up and, and, exactly. and leverage stuff that way. Yeah, and it's really like the time chunks that is, that's really important. I feel like a lot of the time when I was back in college and just writing down like to-do lists, they were just to-do lists, but with no deadline. Right. And I would never get them done because there's no deadline. But when you put exactly. them on a calendar, you put them on a time block that you're going to do it that day and you know, do it that during that time period, it, it, it moves it along much quicker and much easier. Yeah, I, I, I'm in complete agreement with you. I'm going to ring the bell for that. <laughs> <laughs> So have you always been organized or did you develop these habits? When you were a kid, were you, were you, was this, uh, this is the same, you were just a smaller version of you? <laughs> Probably a smaller version of me, but a lot less organized. I think um, as a kid, I mean, um, there were a lot of other things that were going on. And like, you know, I think uh, um, I wasn't as disciplined uh, uh-huh. as, as a kid. And so um, I think uh, as I, got more meticulous about what I wanted to spend my time with because there's always like a million different options to spend your time with. Um, and rather than kind of just, you know, latching onto whatever comes across, I wanted to make real impact, real, make real progress with rescuing the cuisine. I just saw many people fall into the trap where they talk about like a really great idea and like, you know, not really execute on it. Yep. Um, through, through no fault of their own. It's just a lot of, you know, other things, life happens, a lot of things happen. Um, but to basically hold yourself accountable to doing something, making a tiny bit of progress every day, um, that's kind of what, what spurred me to create this, you know, Google Calendar system of, you know, creating little 30-minute time blocks and making it happen. So, um, yeah, I definitely wasn't this way. <laughs> right. And I hope to continue to evolve and, and get better at this. Yeah, that's, I, I hear you. That's great. I'm wondering if you'd be willing to uh, share, a, a, not in this call, but if you send a, just a screenshot of your weekly sure calendar so that we could share that with the listeners, that would be great. Sure thing. Sure thing. Yeah. Excellent. All right. So um, other than uh, food or consumables, can you remember the last thing that you purchased? Uh, yes. Let's say they're all food. 
Oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I bought I bought shoes. Uh, okay. I bought, uh, Kenneth Cole uh, shoes, um, but they're like loafers. They're they're like the right tight, right in the middle of professional but comfortable. Uh huh. So it's like uh, the the right wear for any situation. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but. Um, but yeah, that was, that was my last, that was the last purchase. Excellent. All right. And, uh, how about the last thing that you let go of the last thing that you were finished with that you then released back? Uh, probably that, the, the same pair of shoes, but old, and the old, the, the previous version, <laughs> but, but that's probably a cop out answer. I, 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 uh, one of the things I guess I, 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 uh, most recently let go of, uh, was, um, uh, a garlic plant that I had attempted to, to grow uh, <laughs> and uh, it was terrible. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I, I I wanted to you know grow some garlic and, and see how uh, see how it goes, um, but I ended up uh, I think either overwatering it or uh, not watering it enough mm. and, uh, and died. But I had to let that go because it was it was just gone. Yeah. Okay. Well, so buy buy garlic plant. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna try again, though. I'm gonna try again. All right. Well, that's good. Good. Good for you for not just uh, doing it as a one and done. Good yeah, for trying yeah, again. Gotta, gotta learn. Gotta learn. Gotta get yeah. better. Cool. So at work, um, as, since you're the CEO, uh, co-founder of the organization, how does organization and simplifying influence your choices as a, as a, uh, a leader in the organization? And how do you see that that uh, it affects your colleagues? Yeah, it's, it's huge. I mean, um, one of the biggest kind of um, complications is communication. And I think making sure that everything is simple and clear uh, is really important because it not just affects what they do, it affects the people that are under them um, and so on and so forth. And um, making sure that everything is super broken down and simple and clear is, is something that has to be done on the day to day. And what sure. tools are you using at the office as far as uh, uh, organization goes? Yeah, we used, we've actually used Trello. Um, we're, we're, we mostly moved on to Salesforce through, from Trello, um, but we currently use um, Pivotal Tracker, uh, which is kind of like a beefed up version of Trello, but uh -huh. uh, there's a new profit uh, kind of trial, uh, which is really great. Really love Pivotal Tracker um, and uh, slightly less uh, beefed up version of Jira. So not uh -huh. as many. And complicated bells and whistles, but enough analytical tools for it to be useful. Great. Um, and for our listeners, those are a couple of different task management apps that are out there. Um, Asana, Trello, uh, yeah. Jira, they're all, yeah. they all have different interfaces. Some of them are more visual. Some of them are more listy. Um, yeah. You can check them all out. Uh, many of them uh, have robust free versions that you can certainly use before you get into anything that you have to pay for them, but they're, they're great ways. So we use Asana in, in, in our office here. So, yeah. Cool. Um, as efficient as you all are, where would you say that you still lose the most time during the day or the week? You, you personally and uh, the, folks, the, the folks that are around you. Yeah, I think um, probably number one is the on-demand type of services that we have. So we have multiple kind of uh, lines of businesses are, are kind of what we think about them. Um, in terms of the first kind of most basic bread and butter being the predetermined line of business in terms of restaurants telling us, hey, just come by at this predetermined time and this predetermined schedule. Yeah. Uh, so that's really easy to manage and schedule and things like that. But there's also our second line of business, which is more of an ad hoc system, more of an on-demand system where people go onto our website, request a pickup, and you know, demand a pickup within the next hour or two. Um, when that happens and when that happens on overflow, basically we have uh, a little bit of difficulty maintaining the demand of that service. And so it's a fairly new um, line of business. And so we're still figuring out the exact details of how to go about, um, you know, kind of meeting those demand uh -huh. uh, those requests. Um, so that I think right now is the biggest time drain. And so, you know, it's something that obviously is just for the short term and we're definitely, you know, moving towards a long-term solution with cargo bikers or, you know, uh, different kind of you know, driver situations. But uh, it's definitely one of the biggest time sinks uh, that we have right now, just because it's an on-demand service and we want to make all of our clients happy, uh, just try and figure out the right uh, price point uh, and, uh, you know, making sure that people are retained. Uh, over time. So uh, that is the, the main kind of time suck right now. Cool. 
cool. Well, not cool that it's happening, but cool that you're, I mean, that you can identify it and that you're pointing attention to it. So yeah. it means that you'll solve it pretty quickly, I'm guessing. Hopefully, yeah. yeah. Hopefully we got a better set of problems to deal with. <laughs> yes. Right. All right. So if you could change one thing about the world today, what would that be? Man, there's so many things. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> I, uh, I think the, honestly, I think the, uh, number one thing that I would change is just the mindset that excess food has to be excess food. I mean, I feel like, uh, if I could change one thing, it would just be, uh, in the, in the thought process of, Oh, there's excess food. And then what is the next more, the best way to get rid of it instead of it being the garbage, I would just change it so that it would be donating it or figuring out some kind of solution to use it rather than throwing it out. I think that would be, you know, that would solve so many kind of, you know, uh, our main competitors is, is the garbage can. Uh -huh. um, you know, there's 90 billion, you know, pounds of food being wasted in this country. Wow. Food rescuers. Say that again, please. 90 billion, 90 billion. pounds. Yeah. I mean, that's, I, how do you even wrap your mind around that? I mean, that's it's insane. crazy. Yeah. Crazy. It's just, it's just so much food and, and the real main competitors are the garbage, garbage cans of the world. And, and, and for us to change just that one kind of step in the mind of thinking about the possibility of even just donating it, uh, rather than thinking of it as either illegal or uh, just an inconvenience, um, that would make uh, a lot more you know, food accessible for everyone. Right. So, is there is there a personal version of this? I mean, so this is these are restaurants. So what yeah. about your mom or me who's yeah. making food and oh, I've made too much or well, there's uh, you know, I did a bunch of grocery shopping and I'm not going to get to those two heads of cauliflower before they go bad. I'm going out of town. What am I going to do with them? If I can't compost them, what what can what can the average person do that doesn't have a restaurant? Yeah, um, it's difficult because we only work with licensed food vendors. And the reason is because there's uh, a lot more regulation and insurance that uh, the food that's being made is and being prepared is in the food safety standards and all that. Sure. On, on the personal level, there's no way for the government to go and do checks in your kitchen and make sure that everything, you know, uh, <laughs> being correctly made and all the temperatures being right and things like that. Right. Uh, unfortunately, um, you know, we can't work with you know, homemade food. Um, there are uh, apps such as I think FoodShare um, that does more of a personal kind of just, you know, you accept all the liabilities of the food safety stuff and you just share food amongst each other. Amongst each other. Um, and there's also, uh, I think a couple of kind of community break fridges and that kind of, you know, more local type of uh, solutions. Um, but as a individual, I think the, the number one solution is honestly to just eat it. Um, right. Or for, you know, heads of cauliflower that you're not going to use, you can freeze it. I mean, lots of proteins and, and food in general can be frozen. And if you need to go on a trip, you can, you know, talk to friends and, you know, make sure that, you know, someone else can eat it uh, rather than, you know, going and basically throwing it out. Um, but, but yeah, I think that would be the, the ideal case scenario. I think you can, before that, you can, you know, prepare in advance. If you know you're going on a trip, you can right. buy a yeah, you know, buy like, less groceries, of course. Yeah. I mean, but it's just, I'm just thinking of for the listeners so that there can be, I mean, I want to empower them to be able to make change as well. And so I'm thinking yeah. if, if they were going to do a Google search to try to find those local resources that are person to person, what would they look for online? If, what would the Google search, what would the string be? It would be like food share or, you know, uh, mostly food share type of uh, search terms. So food share with your zip code, something like yeah. that um, exactly. would get, would get them, would get them started in the right direction. So they would right. be able to start to um, see what's available in their local community. Yeah. yeah. But I think, you know, all the coordination on that level is, you know, if you have a lot, large quantity, I think I would, I would do that. But I think if it's a smaller quantity, I think, Freezing it or, or eating it. Freezing it. it or eating it are the choices or giving it, you know, I mean, if you have a specific neighbor, I know yeah. that certainly when I get to travel, I, uh, if something comes up and I just have groceries in the refrigerator, I just reach yeah. out to, to friends and just hand it off to them and say, I'm not going to be here. Here's a head yeah. of salary, you know? Yeah. I think, I think the, the, like all of those solutions work. I think it's mostly that people don't think about the food as inventory or as money. Uh -huh. uh, 
you know, people just, you know, kind of forget about it. And you know, there's so many other things that they need to plan for a trip and that kind of thing. Right. Uh, that the food in the fridge is the last thing they're thinking about. Uh, and it's mostly a surprise when you come back and find that everything's gone. <laughs> right. I mean, that's yeah. always, you know, I mean, those times when you come home and stuff is yeah. rot, rotten in the yeah. bottom of the vegetable, vegetable crisper. <laughs> just a yeah. sad day when you're like, oh, yeah, you know, yeah. I, I like, completely spaced oh. on that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But and, and stuff, right. Well, and, and the consequence is that somebody's hungry. Right. Right. I mean, so there's the, there's the, you have the personal inconvenience or like, Oh, that sucks. Like I have to clean up a mess, but also somebody down the block, somebody yeah. not so far from you yeah. is I insecure mean, around yeah. where their next meal is coming from and being yeah. able to, to, to connect sure. those dots and be smarter is certainly something sure. everybody could take on. For sure. I mean, I think that that is also something that uh, is a consequence, but there's also a ton of other consequences, even if, you know, if people are not, kind of into the whole, you know, food insecurity, kind of, you know, helping <laughs> part of things. People should consider that, you know, food waste is taking up half of, well, you know, producing food in general is taking up half of the U.S. land. And when you waste 40% of that, you're wasting the resources in that land. You're, you know, as a country, we, we use 80% of fresh water to produce food and we're wasting 40% of that. 10% of the U.S. energy budget is basically used to transport food. All of this is from the NRDC report uh, on food waste. Um, but all those natural resources, uh, you know, are going into food debt waste. And if you actually just took the carbon emissions that are from food waste in landfills, it would actually be ranked third after USA and China in carbon emission um, kind of footprint. Wow. So if you if you're a believer of you know <laughs> carbon emissions and climate change, then that could be also a motivator too. I mean, food waste is a huge um, detriment to to the climate. Um, change, uh, you know, discussion. I think, you know, there's so many different factors to this. Obviously, there's the the whole, you know, like I mentioned, the the whole, uh, you know, environmental impact, the the food insecurity impact. But there's also a moral aspect of like just, you know, slaughtering animals that you're not going to eat. Um, there's a whole like, you know, economic imp impact, as I mentioned about the U.S. energy budget, it's 165 billion dollar problem. It's just so many facets. I mean, we don't think about it, but food is so central. To, to life and to everything that, you know, uh, when you start thinking about this, it's like a, a never ending <laughs> kind of, you know, uh, list of things that food affects, so. Right, yeah, no, I mean, it's so, so if people wanna get more involved, where can they go? Yeah, I mean, for us, it's super easy. You can just go onto a website and if we have a branch in your area, you can actually sign up online. Uh, jump in and out, as I mentioned. Um, if there isn't a, a, a branch in your area and you're interested in starting one, you can reach out to us at info at rescuingthecuisine.org. We're definitely interested in expanding to new areas. Super easy to you know start one up. Uh, obviously, it takes some time, but uh, you know this is a very simple but not easy process. Um, right. So um, you know, happy to engage people on starting a new branch. Cool. So when you think of when you heard the expression on stuff America, when we asked you to, to, to come on the show, what 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 did that conjure up for you? What did you what do you think of when you hear the expression of unstuffing America? <laughs> um, I mean, I'm mostly thinking about, you know, uh, figuring out how to uh, get less of the material uh, discussion and more of the kind of philosophical and uh, kind of, you know, other type of discussions going on. Mm -hmm. um, because a lot of times, you know, we're thinking about the next, you know, the big thing coming out in like the, I, you know, the iPhone space or whatever, you know, and, and getting all this stuff. But um, I think that has contributed to the waste problem and thinking about um, how we can uh, unstuff America and making sure that we can think about what our actions are contributing to is, is what I was thinking about. But, uh huh. That's yes. great. Yeah, I mean, there's no right, there's no right or wrong answer. It's just, it is one of those things that certainly, I mean, from my point of view, when I when I started this concept, when I when it yeah. occurred to me, it was it, everybody, almost everybody, has stuff, and the physical is always the easiest touchstone for everybody because if you look yeah. anywhere, you've got a stapler, you've got you know, you've got a lamp, you've got a headphone, you've got a telephone, you've got yeah. something, a table, yeah. you've got something. Yeah. Uh, obviously behind that are all of the, the psychological, emotional, spiritual, yeah. moral, metaphysical elements behind it. But 
as an, as an easy entry place for everybody, chances are most people can look around their homes and their offices and say, yeah, yeah I don't know why I still have that sitting on that counter or on that table. Yeah. I, haven't, I haven't touched it in a year, five yeah. years. It's in a box. I've moved the box three times. I've never mm -hmm. unpacked the box. Why am I still carrying it around yeah. with me? So yeah. it allows, I think it's in that macro micro way, it, it gives everybody a touchstone that they can start there and then think about, yeah, well, so what are the, what are the macro implications of this micro choice that I'm making? And understanding that it is a choice, even right. choosing not to d make a decision is a choice. Once right. you have some awareness, once you yeah. have, once you've brought some mindfulness to it, you recognize, oh, I am choosing, I'm deferring, I'm totally deferring, I don't wanna make the decision now, which again is legitimate. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna try to beat anybody up or shame them for not making the choice. I just yeah. want them to acknowledge that it is a choice. Yeah. Non-action is, is an action, it is 100%. a choice. Yeah. 100%. Well, so um, to someone who isn't an activist or might be intimidated by the current political climate, you know, what would you suggest that they do to become more active and to help create the change that they want to see in the world? Yeah, I mean, I'm a huge believer in kind of small actions. And, you know, that's what we started off with at Rescuing Life Cuisine is one of the philosophies, really. Um, when we started out, again, there were already existing organizations that were doing the large amounts of food. We just wanted to fill in the gap and do smaller amounts of food and, and do that, you know, on a more efficient you know, scale and, um, you know, kind of see what that adds up to. Uh, and clearly that adds up to a lot. And I think, you know, for people that want to make any change, really, um, I think the small steps are really what are going to add up to making those big, you know, super large impacts because you know we never expected to be able to make an impact of like 1.6 million pounds of food from you know we're doing like 40 50 pickups a day now and you know we just still we still think that this is just the beginning and we can definitely grow this out even further and so you know i think um for people that are intimidated i think just breaking it down um when you think about like food waste and hunger it's such a old you know age-old issue and such a huge you know complicated problem but if you just localize it if you break it down into smaller chunks um, and just do and focus on what you can do uh, i think that can make a huge difference on its own yeah so the takeaway is really you can scan the landscape and see where there's a hole that you can fill but it really yeah. it's it's a simple small action we you, yeah. i mean you can have a huge vision and you still also don't need to be freaked out by the scale of that you can just do a thing take an action and it may or may not lead you down a path towards something larger and it also might be that localized specific action is enough it's, it's enough change to make yeah and you learn things as you do it like you know as you get engaged in the space you'll learn more and more about the problems and the issues that you're trying to solve and um you know that can also dictate what direction you want to go in after that point but uh -huh. starting somewhere is i think the biggest and hardest step really no i agree i think that it taking that first step into action is yeah. is a place that many people get stuck in thinking yeah. they don't they don't have the time they're not smart enough um they they don't have the skill set the right skill set and yeah. there's so much need for um participation yeah that it really all of that stuff that's rather self-centered self-focused right i yeah. mean not selfish but just self-directed yeah. you just have to poke through it and just take the step it doesn't really Exactly. let go of the result the action itself is going to shift something so yeah and that can help dictate your you know the flirt. next step yeah exactly and make right. a bigger and bigger impact so cool um just before we wrap up uh is there any last uh, suggestions anything that you want to share with uh, the unstuffers that are that are tuning in <laughs> um no i mean i think um the main thing is you know just check us out on our website and um, as I mentioned, uh, you know, small kind of uh, act of, of, you know, volunteering, donating anything uh, is going to go a long way. So any support is welcome. And um, you know, thanks for the time. Oh, sure. Thank you. I would, um, and I don't, I don't want to switch on the spot so we can talk about this off the air, but yeah. I would like to donate something to, I see that you've got a silent auction coming up uh, <laughs> and I'd yeah. love to donate something to that. Um, that awesome. So, so um, of course, of course. 
yeah. So we'll, we'll talk about those details offline, but people can know that when they go to Rescuing Leftover Cuisine, um, they'll also see there's a chance to, you'll get a chance to bid on a couple of items from uh, Andrew awesome. Mellon Incorporated. And uh, thanks again, Robert, so much for taking the time to thanks. talk to us. Yeah. Really right. appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure. My pleasure. Keep up the great work. I mean, you guys are, it's, it's, it's truly remarkable, the, the vision and the impact that you're having. So thank you. Thanks. Appreciate that. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome.